Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and I'm happy today to be talking to you about gene pools. Now, a gene pool, if you look at this picture <clears throat> down below, is a very, very important idea that we want to consider because, you know, what most people don't understand about evolution, and this is one of the, the large misconceptions about it, is that individuals in a population don't evolve. You know, for example, um, if these zebra, for example, are running in a savanna because they heard a lion coming, and so they're all running in this direction, maybe the lion's coming from this direction, um, let me just jump right into this conversation and uh, see what comes of it. Um, let's say that the the lion is coming over in this in this side, and it eliminates that zebra for for a variety of reasons. It could be that maybe its hearing wasn't very good, maybe it's running very slowly, maybe there's another trait that it has that it maybe its stripe pattern wasn't very good, maybe it was sick, it hurt its leg. At any rate, <clears throat> when a when an organism is eaten, uh, obviously it's not going to make any changes, or even if it survives, it's not going to make any changes. Even if this zebra became like more muscular because it was running around a lot. That doesn't mean that its children are going to be inherited. So one of the obstacles I believe that for understanding evolution is the misconception that organisms evolve. But in fact, the unit of evolutionary change from one generation to the next is a population. And we can consider a population as a pool of genes. Like whatever trait that you wanted to consider, like stripes, we could say, or speed or hearing, we could say stripes, this might be uh, big S, big S, this is big S, big S, big S, little s, something like this. And we might say that maybe slow or stripes or something. If this organism is eliminated, then what we're going to see is some of the alleles are going to be eliminated. And if these individuals are surviving and reproducing, the, the dominant allele will change in the, in the frequency in the gene pool over time. So it's a very important consideration. I'm going to go over this with, in a little bit more detail. So one of the things about natural selection is like here's our lion that I was talking about. If an individual dies, it's not evolving. But in fact, the survivors are then going to have children and that will impact the future of that population in terms of the, the gene pool and allele frequency. And so this is what our conversation is all about. So if you wanted to sort of track if evolution is occurring from generation to generation, you have to look at population change over time. That's, that's the come away message uh, in this uh, particular podcast, is that populations evolve, not organisms. And so what is a population? What is a species? What is a gene pool? What is allele frequency? These are the important ideas that we want to consider. So firstly, I think you might be familiar with what a population is. Like for example, I am talking about zebras, but we could say that there's a, our school is a particular population. We could say that it's the population of San Francisco. We could say a population of redwood trees in Muir Woods National Park. So it's a pr pretty much localized group of individuals belonging to the same species in a defined area. So we could say that Muir Woods has many populations. It has a population of redwood trees, it has a population of banana slugs, ferns, laurel trees. We can look at all those different populations. And what we mean by species, and this is something that I would hope you would understand, but we'll continue to talk about this. A species is uh, again, a, a group of organisms that are capable of interbreeding and having children, and those children are capable of having children. So that so we would say that uh, a species is reproductive and that its offspring are fertile. And so that so that's that's an important consideration. And so let's take a look at this population gene pool idea. So if we were looking at these wild boar, for example, and we were looking at whatever the trait is, it's always good to just consider one trait at a time um, or else it gets too, too out of hand. So you could say like fur color, you could say now it's, it's nice if for example the genotype of the, organisms, of the organism is branded right along the side of its body like this. But basically a gene pool 
is a collection of all the alleles. Now remember, each organism like ourselves has two alleles because we have each we have two sets of genes, one from our mother, one from our father. And so if the alleles are the same, remember an allele is just simply a, a contrasting form of the same gene. You could say all these bore have the same genes, but they may not have the same alleles. Alleles arise again through mutation randomly. But this one has little b, little b, this one's big B, big B, and this one, so it's homozygous, homozygous, heterozygous. But if you took all of them and put them into the pool, you can think of this population as, if you will, a collection of alleles instead of a collection of individuals. Now, if there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven members of the population, you would expect there to be 14 different alleles, or 14 alleles, not different ones per se. Do you follow that? So each organism has two to contribute. So if I said I'm studying a population of trees and there's 500 trees in my gene pool, there's actually going to be a thousand alleles because it's always double because it's diploid. So a gene pool is really uh, and when you think of it, it's, a, it's individuals um, in a collection. And when you look at uh, just the genes, so you're, it's a collection, if you will, if you wanted to define it, it's a collection of the alleles for each particular gene that you're studying. So if it's uh, a population of zebra, it would be a collection of all the alleles of that particular population. So a gene pool. And so it's an important thing to consider like, for example, let me go back to this, and you're like, well, why is that important? Like, if I said before I was using this example of stripes or something, but I could just pick up anything. I can say, if there's um, big A and little a, these are the two alleles for a particular trait in my gene pool. If I said that the frequency of the big A was 70%, then the little a would have to be 30%, because that would have to add up to 100%. So this is what I mean by allele frequency in the gene pool. And again, it's a lot easier if, 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 like the, if it was uh, branded on the side of the organism. And so what I want to say is that one way to measure if a, if a population is evolving or not is if that allele frequency is changing from one generation to the next, because then you would, you would know that there is some kind of change occurring over time, and that's what evolution is. We call that kind of evolution microevolution. In other words, there might be, in the, a few generations, faster zebra, or there might be the striping pattern might be a little bit different as a result of this. So micro means small, so small changes in allele frequencies of a population. And you can, you can detect that. You're like, really, how can I do that? Well, it's sometimes difficult when you look at like it's a single organism, like for example, a walrus, one of the most pronounced traits I think are these big teeth right here. It turns out that sometimes you can't see, for example, if something's showing a dominant phenotype, you can't tell. But if something's showing a recessive phenotype, you would be able to tell, for example, whether it's genotype. So if you looked at this gene pool down below here of mice, these are not walruses. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So if there's 10 mice, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, if there's 10 mice in the gene pool, that means there's probably going to be, yeah, 20 alleles. And do you notice here some of the albino mice are easy to see because they have two white alleles, but you can't see it in a, in a gray mouse, whether or not it's homozygous or heterozygous. But if you were able to see the genotype, you can put out all the alleles right here. And so out of the 20, so it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. So I could say that, let me just use uh, big A for the capital or dominant allele. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So it's 12 of 20, and then the little a would be 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 of 20. And so with your calculator, you'd be able to determine 
uh, the allele frequency. You would take 12 divided by 20 and 8 divided by 20. Now you, you would realize that the dominant plus the recessive equals 1. And so you're like, well, what is this? Like, why do I care about the allele frequency in a gene pool in like the walruses? Well, I could, once I know what the allele frequency is, I can determine whether or not in the next generation it's changing or not. And if it's changing, that means the population's evolving. And that would be an example of microevolution. And so let's do an example with flowers. Um, turns out that a trait that you can consider is petal color. So you can have red petals and you can have white petals. These are tulips. And so if I said that the red allele was dominant, I could use capital R and, and the white would be little case R. And so this would be red and this would be white. If you remember from your uh, Mendelian genetics, this sort of thing. But here's the thing. Like when you look at these, you know that they're little r, little r, but these guys are probably a blend of this and and or this. Agreed? And so it might be difficult to determine the allele frequency at first glance. And again, just to remind you that if you're a flower, for example, you could be big R, big R, or you could be big R, little r. So you're going to have two alleles because um, individuals could either be homozygous or, in this case, heterozygous. And so each allele is represented twice. And so this is the way you would figure this out. If you had a gene pool and you were like, okay, I want to study these tulips. And it's like, okay, how many are going to be in my population? So you, the, you know, the investigator de defines that in some ways. So they're gonna, you're going to say, well, let me let me consider 500 plants. That seems like a, a reasonable amount. So I'm going to say a population size of 500. And so as it turns out, 20 of them, and I, and I know this because I could see it, and when I'm counting up my 500 plants, 20 of them are white. And so I know for confidently they're little r, little r. So do you follow that? So little r, little r, these are the white ones, are 20 out of 500. Do you follow that? 20 out of 500. So I could say that, do you see little, little r, little r? I could symbolize that using a little bit of my mathematical prowess. I could say that's r squared. So it's 20 divided by 500. Do you see that? And so if I were to divide um, 20 by 500, that would give me the r squared. Now, in order to get r, in order to remove the square, what I could do is, let me use another color for, uh, for fun, I can get rid of the square by doing a square root. And so I could say that r is, e is equal to the square root of 20 divided by 500. You see how that works? And then once I've determined r, if you remember before, if I know what r is, then I would know what little r is, then I would know what big r is. Because big R plus little r always has to be one, one. That's what you have in the gene pool. Okay, let's consider this. So if 20 plants are white, then 480 of them are red. But we don't know if they're big R, little r, or big R, big r. So what are we going to do about it? So whoops, as, as it turns out, because the plants are diploid, we know that there's a thousand genes in our gene pool, right? So there's 500 plants. And remember I said before that the white ones, let me repeat this, the white ones we know are 20. We've got to go with the white ones because that's the ones we know for sure are homozygous recessive. So it's 20 out of 500. Would you agree with that? 20 out of 500. And these are the plants that we're dealing with. And so if you look at it this way, if I said that um, the little r is 20 out of 500, when you do the math on that, 20 divided by 500 is 0.04, so 4%. Let me do it over here. So little r, little r is 4%. 4%. And so I can remember I said that you could symbolize that with R squared as being 4%, but I'm not really interested in R squared, so I'm going to take 
the square root of that. And so as it turns out, r, the square root of 0.04 is 0.2. So little r is 0.2. If little r is 0.2, then big R must be 0.8 because that has to equal to 1 or 100% in the gene pool. It has to equal to 100%. So you're like, okay, that's great. So 80% is a big R and 20% is a little r. Okay, do you follow that? But the question is, you know, of, of that, we still don't know exactly how many of them are big R, big R, big R, little r, do we? We do know that the little r is 0.2 and the big R is 0.8. So how do we figure out this homozygous heterozygous combination? Well, do you agree that just as we said before that if homozygous is little r, little r, would you agree that homozygous is big R, big R? So if I wrote that as big R squared, do you follow that? Big R squared. And the homozygous is little r squared. Now, the heterozygous, there's two ways to get heterozygous. You can have big R, little r, or you could have little r, big r. And so as it turns out, that means that there's two big R, little r. There's two ways of getting this. So if you added this all together, let me get a clean sheet of paper here on this. If you really were to consider this, now, what's up with the P and the Q and things like this? Well, I'm going to introduce to you in the next slideshow, there was a British mathematician and a German physician named Hardy and Weinberg. They used P, capital P, to represent dominant alleles, and they used little case Q for recessive alleles. So let me sort of treat our wild tulips this way. See the, see the Q squared? So the Q squared was, if you remember this, what I was calling it little r squared. Do you remember that? That was 20 out of 500. And do you recall what that was? It was 0.04 when you do this. 20 divided by 500. Try that on your calculator. It's 4%. But then to get the little r, you square it. And so the r is what? It's 0.2. And if you know what 0.2 is, and in this case, let me, let me show you what uh, Hardy and Weinberg were using. Let me use a different color. They were using Q. So let me substitute this with Q. So you can say that, for example, um, let's see here, Q squared, and then this is Q squared, and then this is Q. So Q squared is the number of white tulips. So that, be, and, and it's Q squared because they're diploid. So remember it was 20 white plants out of 500. And so when you do the math on that, that's 4%. And then when you square it to remove the square, the Q is 0.2. So if, if Q is 0.2, then P, which is the dominant allele, must be 0.8. So check this out. It all has to equal to 100%. So if Q squared is 0.04, now that I know what P is, you know, like P is what? P is 0.8. If P is 0.8, then what's P squared? P squared must be 0.64. So P squared is 0.64. Now I don't know if it's exactly 64% of the population is homozygous dominant, but I'm guesstimating that to be the case. So I'm going to say 64% are homozygous dominant, and how many are heterozygous? So if I know what my P is, which is 0.8, and if I know what my Q is, which is 0.2, when two letters are next to each other, it's, math, it's multiplication understood. So it's 0.8 times 0.2. I do that first. I enter that into my calculator, and then I times that answer by 2, and the answer is 32%. So 32% are heterozygous, 64% are homozygous, red, and 4%
are white. And that has to equal to 100, or 1 in this case. So this is how we could determine allele frequencies. And like we could do that over here, for example, in these pigs. And this will be the final example of this. If we say, how many pigs are in our population? So I'm going to count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So there's 16 pigs. So I'm going to write that down, 16 pigs. Let's say that the black is recessive in some way. So I'm going to say that represents the, the Q squared is the, the black pigs. And so how many of them are black? One, two, three, four. So that's going to be four pigs out of 16 are, are showing recessive. And they're, they're Q squared because Q squared means that they're homozygous recessive. And so when I, when I do the math on that, I will determine what Q squared is equal to. Then I will take the square root and I'll determine what Q is. Once I know what Q is, I'll know that Q plus P is 1, and then I'll be able to apply this to my equation, and I'll know roughly, I don't, I don't know exactly, because again, I don't know how many for sure homozygous or heterozygous, but roughly speaking on it, on average, or just generally speaking, that this is a good way to determine homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive. And so this is our first in a few conversations that we're going to have about gene pools. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching.